All right, we are live with a special surprise bonus episode for HF Pod. Hey, Brian. Hey, Megan. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. What a what a treat, an honor and a treat. You know, we're just Such giving more content to the people, more recommendations, more of our thoughts, our opinions, our feelings. It's really all about our feelings. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I will say yeah. just. If you're listening, it's because you subscribe to Osiris Premium, which you can, people who aren't subscribed can go to osirispod.com slash premium and learn more about. But if you're watching this live, it's because we are showing you what we do on Osiris Premium. One way to support the work we're doing is to go to osirispod.com slash premium and pay $5 a month to to hear us talk nonsense about stuff, which you seem to like <laughs> because you are because you listen to HF Pod. Um Okay, we're going to talk about notable albums, movies, books that we have consumed so far this year, right? We we said one, yeah. but we all I'm sure I know Brian has more than one. I can probably come up with more than one. I have more well, than I one. I can tell you, I just sent you guys my favorite albums of the year, which is just Q1, you know, we're just at the end of the first quarter of the year. <laughs> There are 38 albums that have made my list thus far. Does that sound crazy? No, there's 38 really good albums. There's probably even more that I've never heard. That's part of the point of all this. There's so much good stuff out there. We just want to share it. I, the, all right. Well, we're going to see. Well, let's just see what happens. <laughs> let's see what happens. I'm not going to tell you all 38, RJ. Don't worry. I'm trying to find one. So well, I'll do that while you go through I have my top this. five so far. Okay, five is good. That's, all I, right. Me- I have my top five as well to share. Okay, okay actually Megan. I have six, but I'll just do five. <laughs> Megan, why don't you I start? I could do six if you want. You want to keep, you want to keep okay. going, at Meg? Come on. Yeah. Why don't you guys yeah, go five start. to one each? You start, Megan, okay. and go back and forth, and then I'll jump in if I have any. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so my fifth favorite album this year is Blue Wave by Granddaddy, and I never heard this person before. It's Jason Lytle, Little, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it popped up in my new music on Apple Music and it's just super California sound. I described it as flaming lips meets cosmic country. It's really psychedelic, but it's super chill. And that's the kind of music I've been into this year. You'll see most of my albums on this top five list are really comforting and soothing. And this is one of those. It's just a chill vibe. It's really nice, like kind of universe to escape into. And I'm really been into it. He does a really good job of like when you're in his songs, you just feel like you're floating and they just expand for yeah. maybe like 90 seconds longer than like you would recommend a song being, but like those extra 90 seconds are what you want. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. you want that extra space. You want the like extended br- instrumental bridge or the outro, like, or like a long, slow intro. He does that stuff really well. I dig this record. Yeah, it's good. Um, it's, cool. it's weird. It's very Brian, weird. What do you got? <clears throat> My number five is, um, the Mesothetics, Mesothetics, you guys know I can't pronounce words, uh, and James Brandon Lewis. It's a self-titled album. This is um, the Fugazi rhythm section with James Brandon Lewis on um, uh, saxophone on the lead. James Brandon Lewis has made some of my favorite music over the last three or four years. He's put up two records thus far this year. Uh, really, really good stuff. But this combination of kind of like garage punk rock with acid jazz dude like come on this is exactly where my head's at this is exactly what i want I put this record on it is um i don't really move like i don't really boogie or dance like <laughs> you, you won't really catch me doing that at like uh fish shows but man this is like music that like will make me want to move it's it's great stuff yeah this is my number six album i love this album like brian you sent us a lot of good jazz but this is my favorite that you've sent me this year it's just funky and like super interesting but it still holds on to the groove and it has that like feeling of you're just listening into some dudes like jamming some like jazz players and also some like cool psychedelic rock stars playing it's just it's driving but it also gets like emotional places i love this album awesome um okay i've and i've listened to a ton of 2024 albums so i'm going to jump in at some point with some thoughts but i want to see you guys probably have some of the ones that i'm thinking of already on your list so um keep going megan what do do you got next okay so my number four is the britney howard album what now totally blew my mind no one is making music like britney howard she's so original 
This album has also the most epic intro song I think I've ever heard on an album. It just comes out. She, I saw her in Asheville in February and she opened the show with this song, the first song on this album. And it's so atmospheric and like billowing and just takes up this giant space. She reminded me of the first time I ever saw Ani DeFranco in that like one woman could just take up a huge, huge space. And Britney does that. This album, it, you have to listen to it a lot though, because it's really has a lot of stuff going on. It's really intricate and it's dancey. It's fun. It's super smart. It's really sexy, but also full of soul. It's one of those albums that's like intimate and personal, but still really like grand and sweeping. It's, I love it. This is a great album. So for the purposes of time, which I'm usually not concerned with, with these episodes, I'm going to <laughs> share this record as well. Cause this is my number one album of the year thus far. Um, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, this is, this is incredible. Um, uh, this record, there's Prince, there's funk, there's soul, there's weird psychedelia. Um, my good, good friend, David Goldstein, when he, when we first, um, when this album came out, his first text was, I'm not sure I would have used all the samples that she used, but I would use 98% of them. <laughs> and like the whole idea was like, this is just like filled with like layers and effects and samples. And it's just like, there's your, your point Meg of like, you have to just like really sit with this record it is so densely put together that every time you hear it, you hear something new. Um, the other thing I love about this record is it is structured in a way that reminds me of some of my favorite albums, most notably uh, Radiohead's The King of Limbs, where you have these first four songs are so like contained and they have so many ideas and there's like this densely layered kind of packaging put together. And then the last part of that album, it just like chills out, it's quiet, and it just like coast to the end this record does that like by the back half of this album you're no longer all like tense and frenetic and trying to understand what's going on and moving at her pace like you're just chill and you're you're listening along with it it is so beautiful by the back end uh this i don't know where this like we're, we're a quarter of the way into the year i don't know where this record's going to end up on my overall list by the end of the year but like i'm guaranteeing it's in my top five wow and it came out early too it came out in like january right it's yeah, this like is, early early February, something like that. Yeah. It was so yeah. cool to see her because it was she was at the Orange Peel in Asheville. She had clearly outgrown it because this album was such a huge success. And everybody in the room knew that like she definitely was not gonna play this small of a venue again. It was really exciting. Fucking I, I'm not on Twitter anymore, so I don't get to see Wolfenhaus's great tweets. Um, but I am just so thankful to get that that note there there from him. Uh you're absolutely right. This is it's it's like a remaining light feel where like you're just contained and yeah. then let's just chill out for the end. It's great stuff. Um it's pretty it's pretty intense. I think it's like a hard album to get into. Um because there's so much going on, especially if you yeah. think about like where Alabama Early Shakes on, yeah. started. Right. right. Like and where this is this sound, it's totally different. It's like the the effects, the sampling, the it's it's moved into a her music has moved into like a totally different genre, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. Can I share my number four before we bounce to your number three, Meg? So that was my number one. So we're we're getting ahead of the game here. My number four is uh at Muriel Grossman's devotion. Uh this is shout out again, David Goldstein. There were um like three or four days where he just sent this record to a text that I have with him and Josh Carver, Nola Sox, another excellent uh, HF pod devotee, past guest, whatnot. Um, and I finally was like, okay, I'll listen to this dude. So she's, I think from Belgium, she's currently doing a um, pay to play tour across America. So you basically email her and say, we will host you at this club or in a courtyard of our apartment or at this coffee house. And she'll come there and play as long as you can provide funding for it. Um, the album opens up with a 20 minute psychedelic jazz song, like done. <laughs> yeah. done. Yeah. It's like, it's like an hour and a half long. And every time I listen to it, I just like, I'm blown away. So um, you're going to notice a pattern here as we move through my overall list, but like, man, that is, that is it. Give me that over and over again. Muriel Grossman devotion. That's such a cool album. It's really I good. I really enjoyed it. Very good. Mm. What do you got, Margie? Did you want to share one before I go on to three? Well, I mean, I'll just I'll just go ahead and just throw this out there that do it. 
the 2024 ted tapes it's fucking awesome yeah and i think that's like certainly the besides the stuff that i have to listen to to prep for this and prep for interviews and prep for everything else that's the thing i've listened to the most it's it's a whole a whole different direction from from goose and i think it's awesome so i wanted to maybe that was on one of your lists but it's pretty incredible I am pulling up the track listing right now because the the last song. What is the last song? Manu. Manu that is, is the best. It's the best. That Incredible. is something else. Oh, God, Manu is. That's what I've listened to most <clears throat> off head tapes. Is I've gone back to that one. I like Leo too, but I really like Manu. It's yeah. The first time I ever heard it, I had Ryan Storm in my kitchen, and we were just like mouths on the floor. Like, what is this? It's so exciting. I mean, and right now we have Ryan Storm in our in our podcast kitchen asking, "Are these usually live?" And they're not. We're doing this no. as a special deal, special deal for you guys. <laughs> All right, who's next? Okay, should I do number three? Yeah. Okay, so this album I'm so into. I have not stopped listening to this album. It's "The Past Is Still Alive" by Hooray for the Riff Raff. Alinda Sagara. Their music is just. Oh, I'm loving this album so much. It's road trip music. It's Americana, but it's super smart. It's like really political. It's about class and gender, and but it's really lyrical. It's That sounds lame, but it's from someone who used to be like a punk rocker, so it's cool. The album is so well constructed. There's no skips on this album. Like you can play the whole thing straight through. It makes me want to just like grab a bag, throw it in like an old truck and like run away and just put this album on loop. It's just, it's so great. It's comforting. It's also really beautiful. And I love the way she sings. She's just really intimate, but also writes about things that are really deep. And I, I just, I love this album. I would highly recommend spinning it. And it's gotten multiple plays for me. I just keep going back to it. It's exactly what I want to hear so often. Yeah, this is in my top 10. Um, and I think it could probably move higher. I think this is the best the best album Hooray for the Riff Raff has made. Um, I was introduced to them through their 2017 record, The Navigator, which was a um, concept record about a Puerto Rican in uh, New York City. Um, like it's Puerto Rican immig immigrant and like all the experiences that they were going through, which is very much uh, her life. Um, and then they put out a few additional records in the late 2010s, early 2020s that didn't totally connect with me, like very climate change heavy, which obviously important, but like didn't translate as well to like a musical experience. You're absolutely right. There are no skips on this record. And this is one of those records that has that impact that is like every song you're like, I know I've heard this before. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like when you yeah. hear a new song and you're like, why does this sound so familiar? Well, that's just like a really good song getting under your skin. Uh, love, love this record. Good stuff. Yeah, I need to go. I need to go deeper on this, um, which which I will in the coming days. Although my brain right now, because we're prepping for our next episode, which is a tweezer madness episode next Wednesday. My all I can hear, like when I'm not listening to music, is just the tweezer riff, which is not that much different from my normal life. But um i gotta break <laughs> not it that up much a different bit. from your normal life <laughs> i know tweezer, tweezer jams are the life. best it's just it's life so life is the tweezer jam perhaps right. we should share at the end of this elongated bonus episode what our strategies are going into it because uh <laughs> i just started preparing that for up. it you no think i just started preparing for it and um i am i'm a little overwhelmed yeah it's a lot it's so overwhelming. I've, I've listened to every I'm tweezer. Not anybody my strategy. I've listened to all of them that are in the the first section, so all twenty from like the early years. Nice. <laughs> That's a lot you've listened so to. Like, only, in your head is a lot of like. Out. Yeah, it's basically the same jam <laughs> combined. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I've definitely learned so that I like I like uh, modern tweezers much better because the early ones just sound a lot alike. But. All right. Well, we, now we know. Now we know where we can. Can't wait to take the Megan. early '90s from you. Yeah. I already got that checked off. Well done. Okay, keep going. Megan's keep gonna going. have to go first. <laughs> uh, so, did you share <laughs> your number three? Time. So it's my turn to share my number three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna share Itasca imitation of war, which I'm guessing I'm taking from you here, Meg. Um, maybe not, but uh, this is Kayla Cohen. Her record that came out on Paradise of Bachelors earlier this year, um, 
this was I think mid early and mid February. This is like Joni Mitchell meets television, meets pavement, meets jam band. Um, it's very noodly, very, very spacious, very atmospheric, but like, man, her voice, her use of lyrics, um, man, I am so, so into this album. It is every time I put it on, it just like lingers in my house like I'm in a cabin. Uh, it like, it, it's a time and place type of record. It brings you somewhere and I can't get enough of it. Um, I, I, I've got a thing for like, like I, I need that mix of like experimentation and really good songwriting to like really capture me. And this has both of those in a way that I just can't get enough of. So I task a imitation of war. I cannot recommend it enough. I back you up on that. That is my number one album of the year. I've listened to this album more than anything else this year. I'm obsessed with it. It's so ethereal, so calming. You know, I teach third grade all day. And when I come home, I want to put this on and just cook and just chill out. It just makes me, it's so soothing to me. It's so gorgeous. I, I can't get enough of this. I absolutely love it. I never heard her before, but I'm, I'm just such a huge fan after this album. RJ, what do you think? Have you heard this album yet? No, I just added it to my playlist because somehow I'd missed it, okay. even though I try to add everything that you guys text about to my list. But, you know, things go, things, there are days, days when I, when I miss days worth of text. So I missed it. <laughs> the text chain moved fast. You got to be on it. RJ set out the entire Oscars when Megan and I compiled like <laughs> 340 texts about uh, Oscars. You know why, writers. right? <laughs> do you know why? Why? You were in because Charleston? I was in bed. That's what you were sleeping. You were in bed. I was, <laughs> I was in bed in Charleston. Okay. I was like, "What horrible thing happened that I forgot about?" Oh, okay, <laughs> you're just sleeping. Exactly. <laughs> um. All right. What else? Uh, um, Meg, it's your, your turn to go number two. It's my number two. Number two. Oh, good. I'm oh, so excited. You guys have both already done number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we yeah, have. So this yeah. is my okay. last. Right. Uh, my right. last share. Um. This album. No one's going to be surprised if you know me what this album is. It came out on Friday, Tiger's Blood, Waxahachie. It's just like my girl. Like the whole reason I'm doing a moment with Meg is so that I can maybe someday talk to Waxahachie. That's like my secret dream that I haven't told anybody. I'm confessing it now to you guys. But I am so into her. I I just feel like she is one of these American songwriters that burst open with St. Cloud in this really incredible album that just had so many hits on it. Like there are four, at least four songs on that album that are just instant classics. And this album is more of a slow burn. It's more settled. It's, it has that like feeling of she's settling into like herself as a songwriter. Her backing band is unbelievable. And I've listened to this album three times since it came out on Friday. And every time I like it more, which is always a good sign. And I'm so excited to see her at the newly opened Brooklyn Paramount which in April, I just drove by it last night. They took an old theater and they turned it into, they like renovated it back to its like original glory. And it looks amazing. I can walk to it from my house. And my first show there is going to be Waxahachie. And I can't wait. Hell but of a if lineup. people have not Hell heard Tiger's Blood, right? Yeah. They got amazing. some credit. The calendar is outrageous. I know. It was packed last night. There were people there. It looked beautiful. So you're going to have to come down, RJ, see a show there. Awesome. With me. Awesome. Um, Brian, uh, go ahead, Brian. Talk about this. Well, I was just going to say, like, I because I've been thinking a lot about this record, because I think you're absolutely right, Meg, like, it's a slow burn. I, I think that the closest equivalent I can come to is, like, St. Cloud was her Lost in the Dream, where it's like a lot of people knew that she was a part of the indie community, maybe familiar with one or two songs, or they'd heard it in passing or seen her open for someone, because she was playing, like, the club circuit in the mid-2010s and late 2010s, and then she releases St. Cloud, and it's like, I mean, it came out this Friday during COVID and I have like vivid memories of putting it on on that Friday night. And it was like that hug you needed during all of 2020. It was one of my favorite records that year. Um, And then if you think, you know, the Lost in the Dream to a deeper understanding parallel, a deeper understanding is like Adam Grandshiel got money, got a label that will support him, that will provide him with all the tools that he needs to make the record that he wants to make without all the stress and anxiety that went into Lost in the Dream. And a deeper understanding is this like slow burn. It's not as, doesn't hit you in the face the way that Lost in the Dream did, but it's technically 
technically a better record. And I think that you might get that out of this where like she has a hell of a backing band, like MJ Lenderman, yeah. Phil Cook, Spencer Tweedy, a bunch of other people are on it. It sounds rich, but it doesn't have that immediate like. So I, I need more time with it. It's, it's in my top 20, but like it is, I, I think you're absolutely right about it. I think that by the end of the year, this is going to feel like a big record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said to you guys you yesterday. Yet, yeah. I listened to it two days ago. I think my, my initial reaction is just like, how do you follow up that first album? You know? Um, exactly. I know. It's probably the yeah. most played album in our house over the past, however many years it's been since it, since it came out. Um, wow. So it's just hard. It's I mean, hard to, me too. it's crazy. It's, it's so hard crazy. to like, it, it reminds me, I think I likened it to like loveless by my bloody Valentine. Like once that came out, it was like, they couldn't really, not that she can't do that again, but it, it was like, it's such a perfect album that that's kind of a hard, it's hard to follow up. There's only Nothing one band that's hungry, done, you know, there's only one band that's ever done rubber soul through let it be and just didn't miss. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, my number two, this will be my last record that I share is, uh, Mary Halverson's cloud ward. This was the first album I heard this year, my original album of the year. Uh, this is incredibly wild psychedelic jazz. Come on. You got it. Like what else do you need? Um, a friend of mine texted me this morning. He was listening to it. Uh, and he goes, I was really digging this until it got to this like weird fish jam segment. And I was like, that's the segment <laughs> right there. I know what you're talking about. Like this is where you take really cool mind altering fish jams and apply them to jazz in a way that is my immediate, that's my zone. So uh cannot recommend it enough. Just wild, wild stuff. It's Brian weird shit Brinkman for sure. Yeah. I, I, I had the same, same response. I put it on. I was like, this is cool. And like 30 minutes later, I was like, what is actually happening right now? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think I bizarre. played it in our kitchen on awesome. Sonos and Rachel was like, what the hell is happening? I was like, yeah, it's a Brian yeah. thing. Really that's cool. it. That's it. Um, Okay, I'm just gonna say just two quick, quick. Um, I think the smile, their um, album Wall of Eyes, really good. Real Estate, really Daniel, good. also really good. Those are two that I really liked. I have you know a hundred or so to get through, so we'll come back and do this again. Um, in it, it, we're we're at the end of Q1, so that's our you know we're we're doing right. end of mm-hmm. end of quarter yeah. update. Um, yeah, you guys but, don't see the ticker going below us. Yeah, this is where we where we <laughs> kind of rate what's happening, stock wise. Um, but all right, like, can we talk about books now? Because yeah, you know, yeah, I'm I'm I, at least I'm reading books. I'm not listening to new albums. But um, let's see. Yeah, okay. How do we want to do this? Let's just do two. Can we do two? I got Perfect. two. Okay, I got two. I think I I'm on I'm on I'm on book twelve. So I'm, 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 Jesus, I'm, keeping it, RJ. I'm keeping it moving. Um, I don't know where to start. Do you guys you want to start? First, you read the most out of all okay. this because you're the all book right. winner. You get to go first. Okay. All right. I'll say I, I will. I want to give, I, there's too many, honestly, to, but I will say, okay, let, can we do three? Sure. Okay. The first one Let's I would say the, um, so Claire and the Sun, Megan, I would put as number four. I'm sorry. I want it. I want it to be number three, but I, but I think it's a fascinating <laughs> book that I want to talk more about. I think it was really interesting and a good way to start the year and and kind of a crazy story. Um, which we should talk more about that. That, but that like that that kicked off my year in a really pretty interesting way. Um, Do you guys know that they're making that into a movie? No. I can see that. I can see that. It right. Makes sense. I think it's mm-hmm. going to be a really good movie. I feel yeah, like I when so you too. visually get to live in that world, uh, Jenna Boyle is that her name from Wednesday is going to mm. be, uh, She's going to be Clara. Clara, and then Amy Adams is going to play the mom. Cool. So wow. she's got. I'll send you guys eyes. a link. That'll be good. It, it's coming out. Um, at the end of this year, it's not named Claire and the Sun, but it, it is based mm-hmm. on the book entirely. See, I, I oh, think I um I think to me, like I'm I'm I have a hard I'm 
I have a hard time with dystopian science fiction, like as a like movies, TV shows, books. So I think that's like I'm still, but I'm still thinking about it, which is the, which is kind of like the whole point of of this, right? So that's why wanna... it was my number one book last year because yeah. like I, I don't like dystopian science fiction either, but I just kept thinking about it all year, and yeah, yeah, cool, cool, interesting concept. Um, yeah, I finished that uh, about two weeks recently, ago. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I was. I, I think I feel similar to you. I like there was a, there. I I cannot stop thinking about it. I think the biggest issue I had was it's it's Brian Weirdship Brinkman, but it's also Brian Over Context Brinkman, and I felt like the book would have been improved if I knew a bit more about where we were and why we were. Oh yeah, well that's um, part of the that is part of the mystery. I know, that's and I kept what makes thinking you like think though. Yeah, but but yeah, I kept like, thinking like he's like, an this author is... that doesn't like give it to you. He makes you think but about I, it. But I felt like he held back certain things that would have been valuable. Mm. Like mm. I, I like I like I totally get, because you're absolutely right. And I kept thinking about this like you dumbass. The entire book is about <laughs> like you are you are you are an AI. Uh, you know, friend to 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 this little girl. You don't know anything. Like the context is what she has. It's her worldview. But I kept being like, but okay, like I just want to know where we are and why we like. Can you just give me like one little snippet about like this is like twenty seventy five? Like I I just wanted to know right. that. And so like that just like kept messing with me because I was, I just wanted to be like set somewhere. But that said, like the idea of developing love out of a machine for a human was mm. deeply fascinating and right in line with where we are in so many ways. Like we're, we're on the cusp with, with uh, technology. Um, I, and then when I found out it was going to be a movie, I was like, this is going to be a really good movie. Like, I think yeah. it's one of those books that when you see the movie, you don't necessarily need to read the book because the movie is going to bring all of that to life. But maybe I'm wrong. Mm. Part of me like makes that makes me a little sad though, because part of like to me the beauty of that book is that the parallel to like how humans created belief systems and the idea of love is that we didn't know why or where we were or mm-hmm. what we were there for, and we had to invent that, and that's what she does. And so mm-hmm. you don't the context is left out, so you can see the parallel to AI to like us developing belief, like we developed a belief system. Right? I love that. That's... I didn't. I did not. I did not draw that connection. I think that that is a very, very deep reading. Uh, that uh, that I'm going to be thinking more about it because that that no seriously that's 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 really helpful. So that's why I think um, the context is left out. I think I think it's going to be yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting to see that as a uh, as a as a movie. Um, okay, can I go to my real number three now? Yeah. 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 Let's do oh. it. Uh, Wellness, which is by Nathan Hill. This was published in 2023, but late 2023. So it's it's pretty new. Um, it's about this. So if you've read The Knicks by Nathan Hill, which I really loved, um, it's about a couple in Chicago and their kind of uh, evolution from like gritty 90s artists to suburban married people with a with a kid. So it's like a little close to home in some ways, but he's really funny. It's 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 kind of... There's like deep dives on like the internet and um, some of these like self help stuff, and um, there's like a whole like uh, polyamorous like section, but it's all like very funny and really pretty like moving um, story, really long and, and pretty in depth um, story. But it's just like it's almost like a it's like friends in, but but not horribly depressing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which I love. I really I love Friends books, but this is like it, it's basically like that, but just um, with a little bit of a different different twist. Um, really, really good book. I just updated That's that onto my list of next to purchase, which is means in yeah. late twenty twenty four because I've bought so many goddamn <laughs> books for the last four months. Because you're motivated to read as much as RJ, it's like it's painful how inspiring it is. But yeah, I, I love know. the Knicks, so I'm excited to read to read this one. He's funny. He's a good author. Um, do you want to go, do you have a third, Megan? Um, yeah, I had, I had two, but I'll do my third one. My third one is I read, um, Hello Beautiful, which was recommended by RJ. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, I don't know that I loved it as much as you did RJ, but I really, really loved the book. 
what I loved about it is it's sort of a take on Little Women, and but it's it's like updated. But what I loved about it is that it's about family and just the way that we hurt and care for each other and families. And I think it's it's beautifully written. It flies by. It's such a quick read in the way that you just want to you just want to keep reading. It's hard to put down, and it's very you can really picture yourself in their world and I really loved it. So it was a great story, beautiful and really sad too. Shit, that, that, that book like really, really blew me away. Really, really insane. Um, That's on my list. Oh, it's really it's, sad. It's, it's, it, it's very beautiful though. It's like a beautiful mm-hmm. book. And in the story, the way it, I think like with anything, probably the same thing with TV movies, any, anything like where you're telling a story, it's really hard to like land the ending, you know? And I, I think this yeah. like does it in a, in a way that's just extremely awesome. Um, I was like, I was, I was definitely crying a lot at the end of this book. I, know, like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I like you told me that. And so I don't know if that yeah. like impacted me. I was like waiting to cry and then I didn't. And I was like, Oh my God, I don't have a heart. Like I'm heartless. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. I don't think that's <laughs> but the, I didn't cry. <laughs> I don't think that is the, I don't think that's true at all. Um, it's a great, it's funny. Book. Cause I haven't, I haven't read a lot of books lately that have like an ending you have to get to like that, like makes the book like, right, and, right, right. And there is like a part, like I read this book last summer, Ohio, that like the last 150 pages, there's no putting it down. Like if you start reading before bed and you get to a certain point in the book, like you're just, you're up and you're on, you're reading because you have to get to the, you have to go through the whole ending of it. And that is something that like I do, I love about books. It's not really reflected in the current list of books I have, but um, (laughs) it's, it's good. It's good stuff. What's your number? Brian? Brian? Yeah. Brian, what do you have Or, or two, whatever you want. Yeah. So, um, just a little bit of insight. So I was not really reading at all. And then these two, uh, really nice, but, um, very pressuring friends came into my life and were like, cool, you're watching movies. Why don't you add books to that? And I was like, okay, like, I don't know if I have time for that. And then I started to read I I took a vacation last summer and I was like, okay, I'll try to read a book. I hadn't literally hadn't read a book in maybe a year and a half at that point in time. And I was like, just like, you know, take it slow, just read. And I haven't stopped reading since. And now I'm reading like three books at a time, which is just uh, insane. I I told you guys this on our last bonus episode where um, I discovered that the library could allow you to rent free audio books. So here's my (laughs) thing. This is what I do. Okay. Do you guys want to know the strategy? Please. So I have a fiction book that I'm reading and then I have a nonfiction book that I'm reading and then I have a nonfiction audio book that I listen to while I take my dogs for the walks for walks in the morning. So I am at, I finished nine books, including those audio books in 2020. How many audio books versus how many real books have you read? I, I, I can't I can't count that quickly, Meg. All right, I don't know who cares. This is bullshit. What, what you told me you'd what asterisk matters? this. You <laughs> promised me you'd asterisk right. this because I just want to tell the listeners and the viewers like I'm very competitive, and I don't know if Brian and RJ knew that about me until we did the draft episode. But I'm highly competitive, and I knew I wasn't going to beat RJ at books because he reads more than me. But and I can't beat them on albums because I can't listen to music while I teach. <laughs> And at work, but I just wanted to know that I was at least number two in books. And Brian now is doing this audiobook thing, and it's just like fucking with me. So, so you, know, you know, you know, you so know. Anyway, so anyway, um, <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'm going to recommend a fiction book that I read. So um, uh, actually, no, because that was 2023. I'll just say the name of it because you should all read it. You guys have read it. Um, Demon Copperhead by Barbara King Solver. I loved that book. Um, and I, the one thing I will say about that book is I read that right after I read uh, Jonathan Franzen's Crossroads, which I loved mm. written about my hometown and is a really, really wild uh, exploration of America. Um, apparently audiobooks don't count. Cool. Okay. I'll just go fuck myself. Love you, Patrick. Um, uh <laughs> 
<laughs> I read that book right after, and I remember being like, I like this book, but like I just read this really good book. Like, do I, you know, and you're kind of comparing. And now it's been like three or four months, and I can't stop thinking about the main character and like the pace and the tone of that book. And I just wish I could go back to it. Um, but one book I'm reading right now that I absolutely love that I'm going to recommend to everyone is called uh, The Quartet. This is um, Orchestrating the Second American Revolution from 1783 to 1789 by Joseph J. Ellis. This is a book that examines Washington, Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison as they realize that the Articles of Confederation are not going to work, that they are going to break America apart, that they're going to turn us into Europe, that they're going to uh, leave us vulnerable and weak, and they're not going to actually allow us to um, uh, complete the goals set out by the American Revolution. And so it's the entire process of how they wrote the Constitution. It is unbelievable. It is so well written. Like it is not as dense or heavy as it sounds. It does not read like high school history class. Like this writer, it just like takes these personalities and gives them life and color and character and the whole book you're reading along just like like I'm just tearing through this thing and it's giving me so much perspective about our country right now how we were founded the you know the bullshit arguments that people you know put put out in terms of um you know uh the the way that like that whole 11 year period is is like twisted into uh, political statements, you realize how um, these guys were waiting through the unknown and there was nothing like what they were creating and they were literally making this up as they went along. And the biggest takeaway, I just finished this today, there's a point where Washington says, I support this document because I believe it's the best document that we can create at this point in time. And there's like a clear sense as you're coming out of this, realizing like these guys weren't searching for perfection. They were just searching for something that was better than anything that had been had been created to that point in time, but also trying to create and keep a living document. Oh my God, dude. I'm just, I'm, I'm so into it. That's really cool. I've never heard of that book before. They were, you know, the constitution just trying to do minimum viable product, right? Archer just taught me yeah. about that term last week. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> so true. That's awesome, Brian. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. Really cool. Yeah, That's that book sounds amazing. Um, okay, so should we go to number two now? Let's, yeah, do, number two. let's do it. I was surprised that my 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 second favorite book that I've read so far is a book called Five Decembers by James Kestrel. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a modern day pulp crime novel, but takes place during World War II. Um, it's about this this detective in Honolulu who is there during Pearl Harbor, and then he has to this thing happens and he ends up going to Hong Kong and ends up in Japan, comes back to Honolulu. And it's like, a, it's a really, um, I guess it's won a couple awards, um, but it's, it's got that like fast paced, you know, detective novel. And, and the, the cover is kind of designed in like the kind of fifties style of, of that. Um, but it's a great read. It's really fast, fun, but also like really pretty, um, has a lot of depth to it. So that's, um, that's my number two so far. Sounds wild. That sounds cool. That reminds yeah. me a little bit of Harlem Shuffle. Is it kind of like that or not really? A little bit? Not really. It's it's no. much more like straight ahead writing, you know. There there's it's mm -hmm. like it's it's a real page turner in that in that way. Like I think Harlem Shuffle. I think I, I just yeah. Yeah. I, Whitehead has like a real poetry of writing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I need to just read like him. I've heard yeah. so many good things. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. great. This is much more just like you just turn pages and then you get to the end and you're like, wow, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, the My Number Two was... book is, is not like that. Uh, it's not like a book that you just, oh, this is nice. Yeah. RJ, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man, to, sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Uh, Mario says, Fish and friends and talk. Love you guys. What's the best way to support you? This bonus episode is representative of what we do at Osiris Premium. You can go to osirispod.com slash premium and you can pay like a few bucks a month and support us that way. Thanks for asking. Okay. Megan, what okay, do you got? So back to my number two. So this is the White Album by Joan Didion. I just finished it. It's a collection of essays 
it's about America in the late 60s and early 70s. I'm obsessed with that time period. And she writes really intimately, but also somehow gets at like larger themes. And this is half autobiography, half reporting. She was doing a lot of journalist work, journalism work right then. And it's such a trying time in American history. And she waxes poetic on like everything from like California politics to like the music industry to filmmaking, art, her troubled marriage. It's just all these cultural touchstones. She was really involved in the counterculture movement then and in it, like she's in the room when the, the Rolling Stones are recording and like she has incredible stories to tell. And I've just always been really fascinated by by her. Her writing is so intelligent and so smart. I don't think I've ever looked up as many words as I do when I read Joan mm. Didion. I'm always like, wait, I don't know what this word is. But she's also great because she writes in a way that is really poetic and really easy to read, even though it's really dense and you can connect with her, but also think about these big, larger themes. And she's just someone that I've never read anyone like her. And I think if you are interested in reading essays that are really intellectual, but also kind of fun, she's a really great person to read. That's awesome. I need to deep dive her. Uh, there's a documentary about her on Netflix about her life that I should probably do as a starting point and then dive into her books because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, the Netflix I, thing's great. You've seen that, Megan? Mm -hmm. Cool. I've, I don't think I ever, I've never pick up a book of essays as a thing to read, ever. Yeah, I, think I, I know I, I usually I, don't either, but I should, but I just don't one. like, okay, that's, that's great. I appreciate it. I'm adding it to the list. So my number two is um, The Wager, uh, Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny, and Murder by David Gran, uh, the guy who wrote Killers of the Flower Moon. I went back to back, Killers of the Flower Moon, and then this. And this is, uh, I think, a better written book. It is so colorful. It is such a huge adventure. Um, my, my dad <clears throat> was out here in late February watching our kids when we went to Mexico and um, he never talking as I was taking him to the airport and he was, you know, he retired a couple of years ago and he is just like trying to figure out what, what, what to do with his time. And, you know, he skis and then he takes care of the kids, but like, what do I do, you know, with his, with his time? Um, and he was like, I, I need to start reading again. And so I bought him this book and I sent it to him and it arrived by the time he got home. Sometimes Amazon is just like crazy good. And <laughs> I texted him like two or three days later and said, did you start that book? I'm reading it right now and I love it. And he goes, oh, I finished it. And I talked to my mom and she was like, yeah, he didn't move from the kitchen counter for like two and a half days. He just read that book. She was like, I have to That's read awesome. it now. Um, this is all about a ship of... Um, uh, from England that goes towards South America in uh, the 1740s, I'm going to say, with the goal of intercepting sh Spanish ships, uh, looting them, and bringing the riches back to um, England. It's uh, during the high seas wars of this uh, 18th century. And it um, goes around the Cape of South America and then it shipwrecks. And these guys spend like eight months on a desolate island off the coast of Patagonia. And then it's their story and it expands into what is truth and who gets to tell truth and all this sort of stuff. It's fucking so good. And they're making a movie out of it. And apparently DiCaprio is no going to be in it and Scorsese is directing it. Um, it is on real stuff. Uh, I cannot recommend it enough. I know RJ, you read it last year. You liked it. Um, I just like every time I would finish a chapter, I would just text a buddy of mine like, Oh my God. Like it's just one of those. It was so good. <laughs> it's like nonfiction written as fiction. It's unbelievable. It's really great. Well, I got to read a, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very I gotta good. Read that. Very good. Um, and so we have, um, we have obligations time wise. So I, we, we originally started this 44 minutes and 12 seconds ago saying that we were going to talk about our favorite albums, books and movies of the year. But we only made it through two categories in 50 minutes. So that means that the next, because Brian has, 45 movies he wants to talk about so for our next bonus episode which will also stream live we're going to talk about movies we've watched so far this year and i think i have watched three so it will be short for me but <laughs> let's talk about our, our number one books i, I also started we... watching tv because you made me feel so guilty and so now i have 
<laughs> goddamn TV shows I have to get through. Oh as well. my I god, unbelievable! Uh, no, pressure. Saying, supposed to be Number positive. It's supposed to be positive reinforcement, but really everyone's just <laughs> about not doing We're just enough. competing. It's, yeah. it's like God forbid you get some content that I don't get. Like I know, exactly. Stuff. Um, okay. I should, do you want me to go with number one or do you want to go Megan? Yeah, you go RJ. I'll just, okay. So this is a, um, uh, I guess 2022 novel called, uh, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, it's about, um, these two, um, college kids, Sam and like a, a man and woman who meet during, um, college. One goes to Harvard, one goes to MIT and they both are video game people and have been their whole lives. And they have this sort of like, um, they did, sorry, they met earlier on, they re-meet in, in Cambridge and they, um, they love video games and they start a video game company and they, they have a, a successful video game and then a bunch of other stuff happens. And, um, that's my summary of most books. Um, a bunch of stuff <laughs> happens and then <laughs> it's over, but it's, it's basically like a love story, but not, not in the traditional sense. It's, it's about the relationship between this this man and this woman who you know first meet in a hospital when they're 10 or something and then end up starting this video game company become estranged and, and all kinds of stuff so it's really cool but also just like never i don't think i've read a book with that as like the subject matter before and it's just sort of fascinating so really 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 good book that is on my everywhere list I, I, go, to people are recommending to me. Yeah, everywhere I go, I talk to people about books and they're like, have you read tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? So I think it's coming up for me. Next few books, probably for sure. What do you got, Megan? So my number two is a book that both of you recommended I read. And it's my favorite book I've read this year so far. It's White Noise by Don DeLillo. I loved this book so much. The short kind of blunt staccato that he writes with it just hit me so hard. The dialogue reminds me of David Mamet, who's one of my all-time favorite playwrights. It's a funny book, really funny, but it's also really poignant. So moving. It made me think a lot about dying and aging. And it didn't hit me though until later. Like when I was reading the book, I felt like I wasn't really identifying with the main characters at all. And then after I finished it, I had this like realization that just shook me. And I realized I, I did kind of identify with them, but in just not such an obvious way. And it kind of shook me to the core. I had to talk about it in therapy. It was a big deal. And I realized that this book is like that. It's kind of sneaky. It's It kind of is so funny that it, it can kind of trick you into thinking you're not being really moved deeply, but it's, it's a really deep book. And it's also easy to read and it's not that long. So if you're trying to bump up your book count to compete with your competitive book friends, it's a good one. But I haven't seen the movie. There's also a movie that is out of this now. I read that back in college and I loved it so, so much. It is on my list to reread because I think I would identify it with it way more now. Um, I've read a lot yeah. of DeLillo over the last couple of years. He is one of my kind of go-to if I don't know what to read, uh, I'll do a DeLillo, mm. but um, I feel like I need to reread that because um, I haven't watched the movie either, uh, kind of because I don't know how you'd make a movie out of it, but who knows? I know, like so much of it happens in his head. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, and it's so literary. Like, hmm. yeah. you should do Underworld whenever you want a, a big one. Okay, I'll add that onto my list. All right, Good so my number one. one. Good one. So, c can I break even further rules here? Yes. We'll see. So we'll see. So my my number one is a book I have not finished yet but I know that it is going to be my number one for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and I can't imagine a better uh, book right now. Great. Uh, and it. that is, that is Northwoods by Daniel Mason, which I'm currently reading and tearing through. And I cannot recommend it enough to you guys. Um, so yada, 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 a bunch of stuff happens. There are these <laughs> characters, they do things. That's where I'm at. No, um, the book is uh, the main character of the book is a house in the North woods of the, of upstate New York that was established in the mid 1600s. Um, and then the entire book goes through the owners of that house. And so I'm about three or four owners into it, about a third of the way through the book. And I just cannot imagine a better book right now. Um, the characters are written so well, it's so rich. 
Um, it comments on the evolution of the American continent, but also like technology and people's mindsets as they're um, watching the country grow and evolve. And you're seeing commerce come to places that um, it hadn't yet reached, but also the interference and, and intermingling of um Europeans who were coming to America with uh, Native Americans, and then also like what this land can give and what this land can create and how it can mm. create empires out of nobody. Um, it is written in a style. So I'm Meg. You read uh, the Overstory, which I've yeah. attempted to read, and I'm going to read later this year. And I remember you talking about how like it was just very like dense and very like not difficult to get through, but it was just a lot. This reminds yeah. me of the Overstory, but a little lighter. Where your main mm. character is, um, you know, an intangible object essentially, but there's so much feeling and color. And every time I pick it up, mm. and I think like, okay, I've got ten minutes to read right now. It's one of those books, and I haven't felt this since I read Lonesome Dove, where like I will just pick it up because I have like a 10-minute chunk, and I know I'm going to get a lot out of it, and then I'm going to go back to my real life. And so I'm constantly reading this book in a way that like that to me is my ideal over everything. Like I don't necessarily need to sit down and read for three hours. I need to just like sit down, go into this book because I have a couple minutes, and then go back to life, and then go back into this book, and then go back into life, and then now I have two hours to read, but like, I just want something that's consistently with me. And this book's there for that. Uh, so I'll I let you know if it ends horribly list. and it right, doesn't right. make my list anymore. <laughs> but like right now, I don't, I, what do you want from me? I don't, I don't know. Like this is when you know, you know. I know. I mean, the book I'm reading right now, my, it might be my favorite book this year, but I'm not going to tell you because my family's supposed to be at dinner in four minutes and it's okay. not four minutes away, but this, I don't want to get off. I want to, I could talk to you guys I know. about, Books and movies could, and music. We could go. We could do it. I can tell you that the, the book I'm reading right now is not going to be my favorite of the year. Um, maybe we should do. Maybe we should go through all the things we're doing now that we that are not our favorite. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> so we're gonna thoughts on that. Do you guys have a couple more minutes? We can talk about. We no, got. We got. Exactly. We're gonna. We're gonna devote the next episode to movies, and Brian's gonna lead us through that discussion. I'm gonna try to watch yeah, like ten movies be between now and then. Just so I I'll can send you over Brian's some motivated me. I'm I mean, watching have, more movies than I ever have before. It's very exciting. I have all the I have the lists. I don't need a list. You know what lists. I mean? I need to I need mm, to watch them. I love Emerson. Um very much Emerson vibes. I'm so enthused by how many people showed up to watch us talk about this. We kind of just did it on a <laughs> thank you guys. Awesome. So thank you yeah, all. And thank, and thank you. you for for those of you listening, thank you for supporting. And, and those of you watching, if you want to support what we do, go to osirispod.com slash premium and you can uh, subscribe for a few dollars a month and get us talking nonsense all the time and and add free episodes. So Yes. Um, all right. Brian, Megan, this is fun. See you guys this next Wednesday so for the draft. So you guys better get yeah, ready. Get ready. Everyone get ready for the draft. Next Wednesday. Everybody get ready. I'll see you then. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs>